Thanks, and I'll hand it over to him. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, this is a presentation that I have made several places uh, from the Sierra Club uh, to uh, air and waste management authorities, engineers, uh, the energy cabinet. So I've, it's got a lot of material in it that is probably going to seem rather basic, uh, especially to all of the geologists in the audience. But there's some concepts that have to do with fracture stimulations and the occurrence of oil and gas that I really kind of like my audience to understand uh, as we're talking about fracking. And to start out with, uh, frack with a K is not a nice word, okay? Uh, fans of Battlestar Galactica in particular know that it's a science fiction euphemism for an expletive. Uh, it's also very common in print media because uh, apparently it's preferred by spell checkers. But FRAC is industry shorthand for fracture stimulation, which you know uh, and by, by, by my use, app, use of the spell checker, there's no K's in fracture stimulation. So there is an awful lot of fireworks in the debate over hydraulic fracturing. It's become very polarized and inflammatory, and what the conversation actually needs are some facts. We need to look at stewardship and, and reason about what, what all of this is going on and, and so people can make informed decisions. Why do we need to make a decision about this in the first place? Well, one of the things that has happened is a revolution in shale gas and liquids. Uh, this has become extremely important uh, in our nation uh, and actually in the state of Kentucky where coal-fired electric units are now being shut down in favor of natural gas-fired units because natural gas right now is what's called the least cost option and is what the Public Service Commission is most likely to authorize. So if we look at it, the United States annually consumes a little over 24 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. The proved reserves, in other words, the reserves that we know are in the ground and we know are recoverable with current technology at the current price is about uh, just less than 100, tri 100 uh, TCF, trillion cubic feet. It's been estimated that there's as much as 862 trillion cubic feet that is what's called technically recoverable. Depending upon who you talk to, what government agency, this figure varies. And it also varies based on what kinds of exploration have gone on in, in various areas of the country. But there may be as much as 3,000 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in place. And this is very significant. So what I'm going to look at mostly is fracture stimulation, look at some of the chemicals. There is uh, questions about the relationship to earthquakes and how horizontal wells uh, fit into all of this. But we're going to talk a little bit about some of the reservoir basics that will probably bore all the geologists in here. A little bit about uh, Kentucky, again, boring all the geologists in here. Um, and then how to get more information and, and we'll put Doug to sleep because he did all of this. An oil and gas reservoir, uh, it, it's got several main properties. It's got porosity, permeability, and a seal. Here we see a jar of marbles that I use to exhibit this. The marbles themselves are the sediment that make up the rock. In between the marbles is the porosity, which is the space that can hold the fluids. These, that porosity is connected somehow, and that is the permeability that governs how well the fluids flow through the rock. The jar itself and the seal up here, the gasket and clasp, make a trap to keep all of this together in the subsurface. Now, fluids move through the rock even though they appear to be solid. Most conventional reservoirs are very similar to a sponge uh, with, with holes in it. And uh, some of these holes, of course, can be microscopic. Here's a limestone. You see some porosity here. You see some pore throats. This is basically a conventional reservoir. 
Uh, but if we look at, at shales, some of these rocks that have very little porosity or permeability are often seals. They're much more brick-like. And in fact, the porosity and permeability of shale is a lot less than it is in a brick. Uh, you need fracture stimulation to get the oil and gas out of these kinds of rocks. And here you see some naturally occurring fractures, but you don't see any holes. Uh, they're much too small to see. So when you're drilling, oil and gas are produced by actually drilling a well uh, in, in the ground, and a vertical well only contacts a very small area in the reservoir. If you drill a horizontal well, you increase the area that is contacted, increase the reservoir volume that is contacted by the well bore. And then when you fracture stimulate the well, you basically maximize those flow paths that the oil and natural gas has from the reservoir up through the well uh, to be produced and available. If we look at the subsurface, this general model has soils, it has an underground source of drinking water, we have potential zones here that have gas, oil, and brine. We have some sealing, uh, very low permeability, low porosity zones in here. And the depth basically increases as you go toward the bottom of the slide. Most underground sources of drinking water are in the neighborhood of hundreds of feet uh, deep, whereas most oil and gas reservoirs are thousands of feet deep. However, there are instances where oil and gas and brine do occur at the surface. We'll find out a little bit more about that when we look specifically at Kentucky. And essentially what happens is the water goes from drinkable in the underground sources of drinking water to very nasty as you get deeper. By law, by the Safe Drinking Water Act, all water that is 10,000 parts per million total dissolved solids or less are protected. That's a federal law. So, so this underground source of drinking water uh, may be uh, only 600 parts per million. It, of course, is protected, but you don't really want to drink water that is much more than 1,000, 1,500 parts per million, but they, on the, on the side of caution, protect all the way to 10,000 parts per million total dissolved solids. Here in Kentucky, that protection is accomplished by, uh, by law. Kentucky Revised Statute 353 was adopted in 1960. That's the law that requires permitting. It establishes construction standards for wells. Drilling records must be submitted. And it requires uh, proper plugging and abandonment of the wells. Basically, knowing the surface elevation and the elevation of that 10,000 parts per million uh, total dissolved solids, uh, this is the depth that is protected, and the law reads that depth plus 30 feet. Well, what is that depth? That depth, it turns out, is most easily determined from a map uh, that was done in 1966 by Hopkins that mapped that specific interface of water. And so that's how we find this difference, and that's how in Kentucky things are protected. Wells are constructed uh, to protect fresh water by using nested pipe or casing that is cemented into place. And if we have here a soil, uh, again, an underground source of drinking water and some sort of reservoir, if we look at a typical construction, the first thing that happens is a cellar and it is basically constructed and they install what's called surface conductor pipe basically to protect the well bore so that the soil does not fall into it. It is then drilled usually on air or fresh water down through the underground source of drinking water and usually at least 30 to 50 feet if not more below that. A string of casing is installed and by Kentucky law that is then submitted to the surface. They then go ahead and drill down to the reservoir itself. Another string of casing is installed. That's cemented in. There is no requirement that this particular one be cemented all the way to the surface, but it's usually cemented so that it covers that underground source of drinking water interval. 
tools are lowered into the hole that uh, perforate the uh, uh, casing and cement so that there is communication between the reservoir and the well bore. Then generally tubing and, and a packer are installed so that the, uh, the fluids, oil, gas, whatever is produced through that production tubing to the surface. So if we look, here is a demonstration of some of the, uh, the casing with holes that have been blown into it with various high pressure, high temperature gas jets. Uh, that's basically what it looks like uh, from the outside if you do it on the surface. There's no cement there. If we look at the typical well construction in eastern Kentucky, here is a, a well uh, done by Equitable uh, in Perry County. And in Perry County, Typical wells, a typical water well is only about 100 feet deep. That's the median typical water well. The very deepest water well that we have record of here at the KGS in Perry County is 784 feet. Uh, for this particular well, when it was drilled, uh, casing was installed at 774 feet, at over 2,700 feet, and at 3, uh, 37 feet. This then gave them access to a variety of producing uh, sands and, and reservoirs that contain oil and gas, uh, what's called the Lee Sands, the Maxon Sands, the Big Line, and in Kentucky, here's our Black Shale. The well was actually completed in the Black Shale. It made approximately uh, half a billion, excuse me, half a million cubic feet of natural gas a day when it was originally drilled and over time has produced about 20 and a half million cubic feet of natural gas. So how is fracture stimulation actually accomplished? Well, basically they inject pressurized fluids down the hole. This can be done in several ways. Um, the original way that was first invented, they used explosives to create expanding gases under pressure. Black powder uh, was the first used. <coughs> Nitroglycerin was what they were using when they started in oil wells in Pennsylvania. Right now, uh, if it's done, uh, they typically use ammonium nitrate fuel oil mixtures. Uh, the controversy is over energized liquids, in particular water. Uh, diesel has been used, is still being used some places, but there are agreements limiting exactly the way it can be used between the U.S. EPA and industry. Carbon dioxide is used as what's called a cryogenic frac, and they are experimenting with propane. There are other types. You can use nitrogen under pressure, either as a gas, or you can mix it with small amounts of water to create a foam. And there are gas jets uh, that are used that, that uh, create low velocity but high pressure uh, gases. Fracture stimulation in Kentucky has been used for more than 200 years. Uh, if you go down to the uh, uh, public library, there is a biography of John Shaw. He passed away in 1806. He was a Revolutionary War veteran. And between the Revolutionary War and 1806, he made his living as a water well driller. And he describes using explosive, black powder mostly, to improve the flow of water in the wells that he dug. Uh, in Kentucky, that was when they first used uh, explosive fracturing nitroglycerin in an oil well in Warren County, and this is what was known as a shot well. And you see, especially if you look up a lot of literature, discussions of shooting wells, that's what they were doing. In 1966, hydraulic fracturing was introduced in Kentucky. It was invented in 1946 in Kansas, was when it was first used. But they found that hydraulic fracturing, the clays in Kentucky shales absorb water and expand. So that hydraulic fracturing actually damaged the formation, reducing production rather than enhancing it. And so they began experimenting, and in 1972 they tried a nitrogen frac, and they have since learned how to mix foam with it. Um, and this is the, since the uh, late 70s, Shale gas wells in Kentucky are almost exclusively stimulated using nitrogen. There are a few foam fracks in some of the big horizontal wells. Uh, we'll see that a little bit more later. How is this accomplished? What goes on? Well, after the well is drilled, 
Um, they will then pump these energized fluids under pressure uh, to enter the existing fracture and pore system. The pressure overcomes the mechanical integrity of the rock, causing it to fail, opening a new fracture. And this is what increases that effective surface area that's connected to the well, where you can get flow. You, in many cases, you have to add sand to this, so it props the new fracture open, because when you reduce the pressure, the fractures can tend to close. You then release that pressure to recover the fluids, and then, of course, your natural gas. So if we look at a shallow well, where basically the weight of the rock column and the water above it is small relative to the fluid pressure that you're pumping, you typically get fractures that tend to be horizontal that follow the bedding planes in the rock. But if you have a much deeper well, you've got a much greater pressure, much greater column of rock and hydraulic uh, gradient there with respect to the fluid, which is much smaller, and so it turns out the fractures tend to be vertical and follow the path of least resistance. So if we look at how underground fluids flow, um, we've got a, a, as depth increases, we've got a much higher pressure. You've got pressure from the rock, pressure from the uh, fluids in the rock. You do have upward forces of buoyancy and capillary forces um, that will help migrate things upward. But when you drill a well, fracture it, and then let it flow, basically this path of least resistance from the high pressure area in the subsurface to the surface is going to be that well bore. There are studies that have shown that in some cases, because of the capillary and buoyant forces, some material may uh, migrate upward from along this stimulated wellbore area. When it does, it typically will encounter either a reservoir seal or it will encounter gas, oil, and other fluids in the subsurface where it's diluted long before it gets to the surface. How do we know what's going on underground? Well, one of the ways we know what's going on underground is, is micro-seismic monitoring. Whenever you apply that force to the rock and it fails, there is a, you see it uh, in, in plan view, here it is in side view, and here it is looking straight down the well bore, and you can see that this fracturing, the way this one was designed, this is actually one that's in the Barnett Shale, and it was a hydraulic fracture. Um, it was designed to go out about a thousand feet to either side of the well bore. So what's in the fluid? That's always a huge question. Mostly it is water and sand. Uh, this is a particular uh, treatment that was pumped by Halliburton. And in this particular one, uh, the additives that everybody is, is worried about is, is about 0.2% of the total fluid pumped. Now in that 0.2%, you have biocides so that things do not grow in the well. You have scale inhibitors to keep the, uh, uh, the casing from rusting and degrading. You have hydrochloric acid, uh, which is primarily used to clean up the perforations in the cement. You have gelling agents that are used uh, to thicken the water so it carries the sand more efficiently. But when you thicken it up, you've got to reduce the friction so it goes back into the fractures much easier. And then once you have the thickening and these kinds of things in there, generally you have to change the properties of the fluid during the treatment so that it doesn't pull, it doesn't stay thick and pull the sand back out. So you have what are called breakers that tend to, to uh, lower the viscosity of the water and fluids so it comes out without, without flowing the sand back. What are those things? I don't know what an oxidizing breaker is. Well, there's, a, there's lists of chemicals all over the internet that are available. But the best place to go to find this out is a place called fracfocus.org. Fracfocus is sponsored by the Groundwater Protection Council and the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, which is kind of a regulatory oversight commission. There are five states 
Although this is a voluntary system, there are five states that have made reporting to frack focus mandatory. If you do a hydraulic frack, you have to comply with the law in those states. You have to make a report here. There are four states that are considering it. Kentucky is not in there, and you won't find any Kentucky wells because nobody's using hydraulic fracturing. It's all nitrogen fracks. Things can go wrong, and fluids can contaminate the uh, uh, underground sources of drinking water. Uh, typically, it is bad well construction. You've got old cement, uh, it's corroded, it didn't mix, uh, you didn't displace all of the water that was in the, uh, the well, the drilling fluids, so it's not good cement, the casing is old, corroded, used. So you've got to pay attention to how the well is constructed. This includes any of the domestic water supply wells, they have to be constructed uh, also. You can fracture out of zone. Uh, by either encountering an unexpected fracture, natural fracture, or an old well bore. If you encounter an old well bore in Kentucky, there is a plugging fund administered by the Division of Oil and Gas uh, that you can, you can have access to to plug that well so that uh, fluids will not get to the surface. There are allegations of induced seismicity, particularly around Barnett, Texas, and Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, there was an incident in Youngstown, Ohio, but I'll get to it later why that Youngstown, Ohio event is not uh, in, in this particular list. If we look at allegations of degraded water quality, the two most famous, one is in Pavilion where the EPA found diesel and gasoline in the underground source of drinking water, but they don't know exactly where that came from. They don't know if it came from a road spill, uh, or, or, or gas leaking tanks at gasoline stations. There was a lack of baseline data, and so the EPA called for transparency on all of the chemicals used. This gets back to frack focus. There was another very famous citizen complaint in Dimmock, Pennsylvania, that is documented in the Gasland documentary. Uh, again, for that, uh, citizens complained that their water sources had been ruined. There was a lack of baseline data, but the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection found Cabot Oil uh, guilty of, of messing up the water anyway, and they, had a, they signed a consent decree to fix it and to clean it up, which they did, and in 2011, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection found that Cabot had fulfilled their obligations and in fact, uh, later uh, investigations by the US EPA uh, said that they were not able to find records of any degraded water quality uh, that had ever been there. So even though Cabot was accused and cleaned it up, they can't find anything. There are also, famously, reports of burning tap water. And these have been investigated. Again, the Gasland film shows a fellow uh, turning the tap on uh, in his kitchen and lighting it and this big reddish orange flame comes out of his sink. Turns out, however, that before the Gasland film uh, was ever made, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission had investigated this, this particular fellow's complaint and they found that it was coming from coal bed methane, which was formed by biologic activity, because his, his water well was using a coal as his aquifer. And it was therefore natural and not related at all to hydraulic fracturing. Another one was in Parker County, Texas, and basically the accusation of flaming water was based on flawed data collection and analysis. It turns out that it was not from the Barnett, but the fellow's gas water supply was a known oil and gas reservoir called the Strong Formation. Uh, it produces uh, it, the, a lot of, of gas and oil in the uh, uh, Gulf Coast region uh, of Texas, and it did not originate from the deeper Barnett. And so everybody was wondering how well was his water well constructed uh, so as not to uh, 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 include uh, oil and natural gas. So basically, there has been no findings of direct or significant impact 
because of, you know, directly due to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, critics say that this is industry double creek, double speak. Well, you didn't fracture it, you didn't do this, my water's still bad, and it's a matter of semantics, and so this kind of complaint will probably continue. There have been investigations of induced seismicity uh, related to possibly to hydraulic fracking. And if I look at the magnitude three and greater uh, earthquakes uh, recorded by the USGS, uh, this is their data set that you can download from earthquake.usgs.gov. I plotted it up and the USGS did a study and it said that there's a lot of new um, earthquake activity. Well, I wasn't able to find a lot of earthquake activity. It does look like recently it has gone up, went down, but I see these upward trends. I don't know exactly what the, the pattern is for this, but it certainly doesn't seem to me to be a, an obvious uh, increase uh, that I can blame on, on modern activity. But it turns out the USGS subset this data and only looked at the at what they call their mid-america data set and yeah if you only look at that data set here's the average number of quakes and then it does it does increase so what the usgs concluded was that the quakes were not directly the result of hydraulic fracture stimulation what they concluded was it was actually associated with wastewater disposal and it was in the Youngstown area wastewater disposal wells that were associated with those quakes. The wastewater disposal wells are regulated uh, under UIC uh, underground injection control uh, programs of the US EPA and so the USGS study and data are, are, are being peer reviewed right now so there's no official report yet. The National Academy of Sciences looked at the same problem and they concluded that fracturing um, poses very little risk for causing earthquakes and that the risk is higher for wastewater injection wells, which parallels the USGS uh, conclusion. So when you look at induced seismicity, injection in my opinion is safe and it is regulated to protect fresh water there are many thousands of disposal wells there are a few dozens with potential problems there has been no property damage and no injury or fatalities so what it's likely there will be some new uic siting and permitting requirements and it's potential that they will change the best management practices and operational guidelines uh, for these wells so if we look at Kentucky, uh, our surface geology gives us clues as to what is going on uh, in the subsurface. Uh, one of the things that I, I always point out is that uh, Kentucky has two coal fields, eastern and western, separated by uh, this Cincinnati arch. And that essentially as you go away from the crest of the arches, uh, the, the reservoirs are getting deeper and thicker as you go to the east or into the uh, western Kentucky coal field. The resources have always been important. This is a map 1784 um, from Filson and you will note that the settlers coming to Kentucky down the Ohio River did not carry refrigerators with them. Uh, they looked for salt springs and salt was very important for food preservation and others. So you can see they noted these things on their maps. But you also see that we have parks that are dedicated to these surface expressions of, uh, of salt springs. That's Big Bone Lick State Park noted on uh, a 1784 map. It actually was noted on a 1755 map by Evans also. So natural springs and seeps will affect the surface water quality and 922 places in Kentucky are named for oil, gas, salt springs, licks, forks, rivers. We have burning springs. So all of these places are where naturally occurring chemicals may, get, may be in the groundwater, your underground sources of drinking water to begin with. 
In Kentucky, if we look at our history in manufacturing salt, natural gas was first used uh, from the uh, Devonian New Albany Shale uh, just before and during the Civil War in the manufacture of salt. Uh, when they drilled the salt water wells uh, here in parts of Meade County um, and, and established their salt works, natural gas was produced along with the brine and so they used that to evaporate it. The big use of natural gas in Kentucky really started uh, in 1915 in what we now call our big sandy natural gas field in the eastern coal fields where they began producing natural gas and making uh, uh, carbon black which is an ingredient in plastics and, and, uh, and various other manufactured products. The gas well itself takes up very little space. Uh, uh, this is a set of valves on a well head here. You've got an entry into the hole, the vertical. Uh, there are gas supply valves and then access to those annuluses that they had. This is, this well was being tested. Uh, this is not an official permanent uh, hose. Uh, this would not be the, the final setup for an actual producing well. Uh, this one was shut in while they were testing it. Um, in 2011, 35 counties reported the production of over 124 billion cubic feet of natural gas, 98% of which comes from eastern Kentucky. Now, severance tax was paid on 245 billion cubic feet, but when you separate the liquids from the dry gas, this is about what we're getting for, for dry natural gas production. And you can see that here. Our production has generally increased since the 1980s. Uh, looking at the production of dry gas and in the natural gas and liquids and condensates, we do have some, but not enough to attract a, a two and a half billion dollar shell ethane cracker plant. The Devonian shale is deepest and thickest in eastern uh, and western coal fields. It's pretty nondescript. Uh, it's just a, a layered uh, and, and fractured at both the outcrop level and at the level of thin sections when you look at it under the microscope. We have approximately 12 to 1300 horizontal wells in the state of Kentucky, most of which have been drilled in eastern Kentucky and most since 2007 uh, in the shale. As I said, they contact more of the gas bearing formation and multiple wells can be drilled from the same uh, surface location. You can see some complex geometries here of showing multiple wells. The standard design for these wells, this is actually from uh, Equitable EQT. You see nested casing cemented here to the surface and you see what they have illustrated here is a packer port system where you've got packers that isolate serially different sections of the hole and little ports that open up. Uh, this is actually a really clever uh, device here is a ported completion tool. Um, you've got a, a seat for a ball. Um, here is, is one of the balls. It's the smallest diameter. It actually goes all the way to the toe of the tool <laughs> string. Uh, here's a much larger diameter ball that goes intermediate. The ball will be pumped with fluid down here. It will seat in one of these seats and it will cause this sliding mechanism to slide and lock in a lower position opening these holes so you can actually pump the treatment. Um, here in Kentucky, this is a stimulation for a horizontal well that uses a lot of water for Kentucky. Um, in total, it used approximately 120,000 gallons of water as opposed to three to five million gallons of water that they're using for hydraulic fracks in Pennsylvania. The water was used as a foaming agent and there was also water uh, fluids uh, in the acid that they used to clean up the perforations. But as you can see, the sand propping here, they're using um, uh, 500 pounds or so each stage, there's nine stages. And then you can also see the, uh, uh, the total amount of nitrogen is, is pretty large that they used on this well. Uh, this is a nitrogen fracture stimulation. Each of these trucks delivers liquid nitrogen to the hole. Uh, it then goes into a vaporizer, this little guy on the side of the truck right here, uh, where they actually vaporize it. it. It then gets pumped through a series of manifolds 
uh, down uh, into the hole and, and used to stimulate the well. Here at KGS, we do have public records. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think everybody is familiar. Uh, we have uh, data search facilities where you can select information. Once you find the information on our results page, you can view and download production data. You can look at the documents. You can download TIFF images of, of information. And you can find out where it is by jumping to a map or download it to your GPS. And then you can download this all the data that you find to spreadsheets. These are all In terms of public disclosure, um, what we have, we have the original drilling records that anybody can examine for free. And it has on there information about the casing and cement records that are available. It also has completion and stimulation data about how much nitrogen, how much sand, how much water and acid. All of this is publicly disclosed on our website. Uh, we do have a map interface for looking at spatial data. Uh, you can get uh, topos, geologic maps, air photos, or planimetric maps. Uh, you can check and see what kinds of things you want displayed uh, by controlling on our layers list, oil and gas wells or horizontal boreholes. All of that's controllable. We also have a mobile application uh, that gives you access to the same types of functions but you don't have to install any uh, application on your smartphone or tablet. It's all done on the server. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we haven't yet figured out about displaying documents, uh, but we're working on, on that in the mobile environment. But you can look for oil and gas wells, springs, water wells, coal, borehole and thickness, um, a lot of different types of information. Again, in the mobile interface, you can find out data about the wells, uh, just recently, in October, a new issue of the Energia publication uh, by the Center for Applied Energy Research, uh, they asked me to write a short little article about um, uh, fra fracture stimulations and is it dangerous. This is also available and, uh, that anybody can, can read and access. So, in conclusion, the basic thing is to focus on well construction especially for the gas wells and uh, looking at how the domestic water supply wells are actually constructed too. We need to support disclosure, especially looking and using frackfocus.org. Induced earthquakes are being um, studied, but it appears injection is safe. There are tens of thousands of injection wells out there that have been operating for 40, 50 years or more. Probably there's going to be some new best management practices for siting, monitoring, and operation of those wells. So thank you, and I'll answer any questions you might have. Yes? Who makes up the oil and gas conservation quantity? Just out of curiosity. The Interstate Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is actually made up of the regulatory bodies of oil and gas producing states. And what they do is they get together and um, review the oil and gas regulations. Are these adequate? Are they covering the uh, things they need to cover? Uh, and, and they basically grade all of their members, all of their states, as to how good or bad their oil and gas regulations are. And Kentucky is a member state of that. So we get, uh, Kentucky gets graded, I think, every five years on, on how effective uh, its oil and gas regulations are. Yes? So the nitrogen method is different than traditional hydraulic fracturing? Is that well, it's they different. Use the sand and water? Or it they? is different in that they're using a different carrier fluid. They put it under, they, they still put it under pressure. It still induces fractures because the pressure overcomes the mechanical strength of the rock. Okay, that's all the same. But nitrogen doesn't damage Kentucky's uh, shale, uh, which would be damaged uh, in, in a pure hydraulic frack. Uh, there's too much damage in the, uh, the clays swell, and it damages way too much. Uh, we use some water in some of the larger fracks to create a foam. The foam basically carries the sand much more effectively than just a gas. If it's just gas alone, 
you kind of have to blow the sand into the fractures rather than carry it, and that's not very effective. Yes? Uh, talking about the uh, mechanicals, I often see that uh, most of them have water, only 0.2% have chemicals. So if you say, okay, I've got only 2,000 ppm of chemicals, do you think they're going to freak it out? Instead of saying 0.2%, basically the same thing. Yeah, look, well, if, if you are pumping 3 to 5 million. Um, no, you know, what I'm saying is that often people are going to use mechanicals, they're trying to sort of soothe the public saying, don't worry, only 0.2% have chemicals in the fluid. But 0.2% have water, so you can use the fluid to make it more stable. Yes, on, on many of those. And that's why, that's why I actually, that, um, I'm not sure how many of them are there. So the water what, what happens is, uh, maybe I did, what, when they flow back the chemicals, uh, when it comes to the surface, all of that is regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act. And so typically what happens is it is collected in the tanks that it came from and is either uh, <laughs> delivered to a disposal site or delivered to a treatment site. Uh, so, that, uh, so that, yes, you know, they're, they're, they do exceed, uh, especially, for example, uh, one of the... Uh, <coughs> One of the friction reducers is ethylene glycol, uh, antifreeze. It's common. Uh, everybody uses it. Uh, it's used in, in, uh, in these frac fluids. I wouldn't want to drink water with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know 0 0.1 or, or less percent ethylene glycol in it, uh, especially over a long period of time. But it can be cleaned up, and that's where it, that's where it typically goes, either to a disposal site or uh, to a treatment site. Now, oil and gas companies are experimenting, for example, with propane fracks that completely eliminate the use of water and a lot of those additives, it, those, uh, they all go away. Uh, propane is not cor uh, corrosive and it won't, cause, it won't cause degradation of the, the steel casing and cement. Uh, it's, it's very expensive right now. Uh, but that's one thing, and then the, then they're also experimenting with biodegradable additives. They're replacing things. Well, the most the added the, the one additive that is often at the greatest concentration in hydraulic uh, frac fluids is the uh, the gelling agent, and the most often used gelling agent is the same thing that's in ice cream and chewing gum. It's guar gum. So in fact, there's a shortage uh, of guar gum. If you see your, uh, the, the price of ice cream going up in the grocery stores because there's, there's not enough of it <laughs> for hydraulic fracturing. Yes? Uh, although we've avoided the controversy around hydraulic fracturing, I think it's important to, to mention the fact that these nitrogen fracks have to be flowed back. The nitrogen basically dilutes the gas in the well for a short period of time, these wells are flowed back until the gas quality, until the methane content gets to a, a, a significant percentage that they can sell the gas. So that is a concern, and EPA is looking at methane emissions. So these wells are flowing methane freely to the atmosphere, and there are concerns about the effects on, on climate change and, and greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of thing from these nitrogen fracks. So they're not totally devoid of environmental uh, effects. So, and it, it's also mind. fair to say that, that methane is flowed to the surface from the hydraulic fracks also. Right. Uh, so, you know, it's, there's, it's not completely benign, but it's, studies have also shown that it, that it is possible. Uh, they are putting uh, money into research on methane recovery systems uh, so that they equipment is installed on the wellhead that prevents methane from being emitted into the atmosphere during these various flowback periods. Because let's face it, uh, methane that you flow into the atmosphere is natural gas you can't sell. And that's, that's the whole purpose. They want to sell natural gas. Yes? How deep are the wastewater injection wells? 
The two that we have in Kentucky uh, right now are 8,000 some odd feet. Uh, and the one in Young, the, the ones in Youngstown, Ohio were like 10 to 12,000 feet. Uh, so the, the, those waste disposal wells are generally pretty deep. 